for today and uh, and let him get going on the presentation. Uh, let's see here, let me find. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce your speaker, Dr. Gleb, who was lauded as office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His ex expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud U Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends an abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking uh, expertise, he's gonna be speaking to us on his subject matter expert uh, topic, which is leading virtual teams. Uh, and so everyone, let's please wa welcome Dr. Gleb. Dr. Gleb, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, thank you for there letting you me know. Can you, okay, there you go. Okay, yes. yes. Oh, Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it, Kim. So let's talk about how you can be effective leaders in hybrid work, focusing on how you as HR professionals can also not only be leaders yourself, but support those business leaders you work with. So that's what we'll be focusing on. That's the shape of the presentation. So first, we'll talk about the framing, how we think about hybrid work. We'll give some data, some research on hybrid work. So we'll talk about hybrid work research, what you need to know as HR professionals. Then some of the typical mistakes that leaders and HR professionals make when they approach hybrid work. And finally, we'll finish off with some really practical strategies, some techniques you can use for best practices in hybrid work leadership. That's the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. All right. Without further ado, let's talk about how we think about hybrid work. Now, let's have a thought experiment. Now, right now, let's say over lunch, you go and you open your fridge and you see that there are, or break room in the office, whatever you happen to be, you see there are two options for ice cream that you have. And one version says an ice cream that contains 10% fat. So ice cream that contains 10% fat. Another is 90% fat-free. So 90% fat-free. So two versions of ice cream, not different, except one says 10% fat, the other is 90% fat-free. Now, when you're thinking about these options, which option sounds more appealing? Is it the one that says 90% fat-free or 10% fat? Please go ahead and vote. You should have a vote on your Zoom poll. Please go ahead and vote which of these sounds better to you. All right, I see most of us participated. Great. So overwhelmingly, 90% fat-free is what people would prefer. So 90% fat-free. But of course, if you think about it, 90% fat-free is the same as 10% fat. And 10% fat is the same as 90% fat-free. But we certainly have a clear preference. I mean, 80% of us would prefer the 90% fat-free, right? So what's going on here? Why do we have such a clear preference one way here? Well, it has to do with something called the framing effect, the framing effect. How the information is framed for us, how we see the information, how we perceive the information, how it's presented to us really 
crucially determines how we think about it and how we make our decisions. So that's what I want you to think about. How do you and how do your leaders frame the question of hybrid work? Hybrid work. And by the way, you should be able to see my slides fully. If not, make sure you go and click on full screen so that you can see my slides fully. Now, many, many leaders, unfortunately, see hybrid work as a loss, as a problem, as a problem they need to solve, they need to address it. And they don't really see it nearly sufficiently for what it is. It's a disruption, which means it's a major opportunity to seize, to seize competitive advantage. So you really need to frame hybrid work as a major opportunity, not as a loss. That's how you improve retention and productivity while also at the same time cutting costs. Because of course, if you have retention and productivity benefits, then your costs will be lower and you can control your costs better, keeping retention and productivity the same. So it depends on how you, which way you want to play that. But definitely if you treat hybrid work as an opportunity, you will be able to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs all at the same time. Now, this is very important. We'll talk about the data, but the key here is that doing so will allow smart and savvy leaders to seize competitive advantage and win the talent wars and win the productivity wars and the engagement wars while also controlling costs. Here, what you want to do is not put your personal comfort in front, in front of the bottom line. That's the crucial thing here, because I see so many leaders making this, these mistakes. I've helped over two dozen companies figure out their hybrid work plans. And the biggest problem, the number one problem, is that leaders feel personally comfortable with a certain course of action, and they pursue that course of action, even though it's going to hurt them in the bottom line, because they will have lower productivity, they'll have lower retention, and they'll have higher costs. So that's what you really want to focus on. How do you have that high retention, high productivity, lower costs, and how do you make an effective business case for that as HR professionals? And that's what we'll be talking about the data. So you need to help the leaders you work with put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences, and focus on business objectives, business outcomes, rather than what might be personally comfortable for them or for you. And you want to overcome decision-making cognitive biases in the future of work and help the leaders you work with do so as well. And as part of doing so, integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements around hybrid work. Because the thing about hybrid work, it's neither fully remote work nor in office work. There are so many varieties of how you can do hybrid work. And there are many ways of doing it wrong and less ways of doing it right. And we'll talk about the ways of doing it right. So let's go now into the data. That's the way, you, that's the first part of the presentation, the framing around hybrid work. Let's talk about the data, the research. There have been many major independent surveys. I'll give you some research based on eight of them that have been very credible without any stakes in the outcome. So for example, the Society for Human Resource Management Survey. So from the National Society, the Gallup Survey, the Harvard Business School surveys, the Donald Stanford University Survey, they don't have any stakes in the outcome. Now, these surveys find, broadly speaking, that 75% to 85% of remote capable workers, those who can work remotely, don't want traditional office-centric work. They don't want traditional nine to five, Monday through Friday. 25 to 35%, depending on the survey, want full-time remote work. But that means that the majority, 50 to 60%, want hybrid work. So you can satisfy the majority through hybrid work. And that's what I really wanna focus on. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. So coming in full-time is a problematic option, even though very many CEOs would like to get there. There was a recent survey by KPMG, the accounting, major accounting firm, which showed that 64% of CEOs of companies with over $500 million in revenue would want their staff to be in the office full-time by 2026. And that's a big problem because those are the companies that will be shedding workers and losing their best talent, as we can see. Over 70% would be less likely to, to leave if offered substantial remote work, over half the work week. Now, we know that remote employees are more productive when they're working remotely if they also spend some time working effectively in the office. So this is about employees who have a hybrid modality. 
55% report higher productivity when working remotely, 15% report lower, and 30% report the same. And that's only self-reports. Employee monitoring software shows the same thing, that staff who are working remotely are 5% more productive. And that's important findings. Also, Stanford University studies show the change in their productivity. In May 2020, those who are working remotely compared to those who are working in the office were 5% more productive. So that soon after the transition during the early part of the pandemic. By May 2022, they were 9% more productive, 9% more productive. What explains this change in productivity? Well, people became increasingly capable of working remotely. Teams figured out how to do collaborative software, invested into various backend technologies, people invested into their home offices, and so on. So there were a lot of affordances that enabled people to work more effectively two years into the pandemic than compared to at the start of the pandemic. And of course, those have continued to improve. So the technology with which we work remotely has continued to get better over time. So by now, the productivity gap is even higher. Remote and hybrid employees also have better well-being. Over 75% report feeling less stressed, over 70% report better well-being, and over 75% report feeling happier. Now, thinking about that, I'd be curious to ask what your preferred working style is. Please go ahead and vote. Fully remote, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full-time, five days in the office. Please go ahead and vote. Almost still participated. Five more seconds for those who didn't. Go ahead. Let's hear what you prefer to be around the office. Okay, so here no one would want to be full-time uh, in the office. Something like 15% of us would want to be full-time remote. And the plurality... If we look at the distribution, so something like over half of us would like to spend over half the work week outside the office. So clearly there's a clear preference there. Good, good to know. And then, um, okay. So that's what the people on the presentation would want. Let's talk about some of the mistakes that leaders make when they approach hybrid work and remote work. And these are decision-making cognitive biases. Now, cognitive biases, you might have heard about this term before. That's kind of my area of expertise. That's what I've spent so much time studying. I've spent over 15 years in academia researching this topic, and I've consulted on this topic and trained on this topic since 1999. So I have a lot of experience with a lot of companies helping them figure this out. Cognitive biases are the errors we make because of how our mind is wired. So that's what cognitive biases are. Our mind is not really wired for the modern environment. It's wired for the ancestral savanna. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, and we had to survive due to the fight or flight reflex, and our survival was very precarious. So when the environment changed, that was a bad thing. We really wanted to get back to the previous environment because of how precarious our survival was. And so our minds have a status quo bias, a predisposition, an anxiety to be worried about new situations when we've gotten comfortable and familiar and we feel powerful and capable within previous situations. So think about leaders. They have been successful for 20, 30, 40 years in the office, and that's where they want to be. That's where they want to go. And they want to maintain or get back to that status quo, as we've heard from the CEOs. And the CEOs tend to be, of course, for pretty senior folks who have been in their 60s and so on, who have been very successful in the office. And there's a tendency to ignore the fact that major disruptions change our environment. In the Savannah environment, that wasn't the case. The major changes were just the changes of the season, spring, summer, fall, winter, and around in a cycle and so on. But in the modern world, we have major disruptions. It could be the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis. It could be the rise of the internet. It could be the rise of smartphones, the pandemic, work from home, generative AI. They change our world and we need to adapt. But it's very hard for us, for our minds to adapt from to major disruptions. And so status quo bias is a serious problem. And I help leaders 
in the companies that I advise, status quo bias is a major obstacle that I see. Now, another major obstacle that I see is called the empathy gap. The empathy gap. In the Savannah environment, it was important for us to be empathetic toward those who are sharing, uh, sharing and understanding the emotions and caring about the emotions of those within our own tribe and not very empathetic, not caring about the emotions of people in other tribes because we needed to be able to oppose them effectively. Well, in our modern environment, there's a tendency to underestimate the emotions of people who don't share our predispositions. So other people, we tend to underestimate the importance of their emotions. And we very clearly see that people have much stronger desires for well-being and flexibility after the pandemic. In fact, there was a recent study from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis that showed that educated white males, college educated males, are actually voluntarily spending less time working and more time on their well-being. And so they're deliberately, there's their work, so the, they're working at the same rate, even a little bit higher rate than before the pandemic for those demographic participation, but they're spending less hours working. So they're voluntarily choosing to have more leisure and less money earned. And there's plenty of other research that shows the same findings that people are spending more time in leisure activities, less time working. And so that's a serious empathy gap from among many leaders. And finally, functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. You might have heard of the hammer nail syndrome, where there's a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, this is kind of like that. It's about the fact that when we learn to function in a certain way, in a certain context, we tend to apply that context to all other contexts. So when we learn to lead in the office, when we learn to manage teams in the office, when we learn to communicate and collaborate in the office, we tend to apply that to all other contexts. And so we perceive only one right way of functioning in certain contexts, and we don't notice when the context changes, when previous ways of functioning have become dysfunctional. So we transpose office-based culture on hybrid work and remote work, and then we wonder why it doesn't work very well. So there's a failure to adapt strategically to the new reality that we face. And I see this all the time in the companies that I work with. And I'm curious, of these cognitive biases, which of these do you think might be the most problematic for your organization? Please go ahead and vote. Which of these do you think might be most problematic for your organization? Okay, I see most people voted. I'll give five more seconds. Make sure to go ahead and share which one of the cognitive biases might be most problematic. Okay, everyone voted, great. So you see status quo bias is the first with just about half of the people seeing then a third for functional fixedness and then a fifth for the empathy gap. So good to know that these breakdowns and you want to bring this information back to your teams, let them know what you see as the biggest problems. Good. Okay. Now we've talked about the cognitive biases. So I said four parts. One is about how we think about hybrid work, then the data on hybrid work and remote work then cognitive biases, the mistakes. Now we're going on to some best practices for hybrid work and remote work to make sure that you don't undercut your competitiveness in the future of work and make the best decisions. So what are the best practices? The best practice clearly is a team-led model. So what does that mean, a team-led model? That means you let teams together figure out in a consensus-based manner when they're coming into the office, why they're coming into the office, for what time, teams, departments. So you push down the decision-making as much as possible to the lowest unit. Rank and file teams of four to eight people, whatever the size is in your organization. Of course, they can coordinate within their departments, but really having that team make the decision is the crucial thing. What that does is that it buys strong buy-in. It results in strong buy-in. When those four to eight people get together, 
and they figure out, okay, this is when we're going to come in. This is for what reasons we're going to come in. And they customize it to their needs. So think about, let's say, accountants. Accountants, when I've worked, worked again with over two dozen companies and organizations helping them figure this out, accountants don't need to come in every week even. They usually come in more at the end of a month or at the end of a quarter for several days to close the books. And during the rest of the time, they might come in once a week or they might not come in at all. If you think about others, let's say salespeople. I've generally seen salespeople, depending on the kind of work they do, but many want to come in more often because they enjoy being around other salespeople. They tend to be more extroverted. They want to socialize. Programmers tend to not want to come in as much. They maybe come in at the beginning of a sprint and maybe at the end of a sprint so for a day or something like that to chat to each other. If you are going to be someone like architects, architects tend to want to spend more time in the office. So spending more time in the office is important for them. So it really depends on your role and what kind of activities you're going to be doing. And it depends on the team because you're talking within each team, you're creating buying, you're creating incentives and you're creating mutual commitment and mutual responsibility. So there is some positive peer pressure for people to abide and commit. And you don't need to have surveillance or top-down monitoring of people coming in. And you also see that this is borne out by the research. So Gallup did research showing that the highest engagement of all possible engagements, high levels of engagement comes when the team together makes the decision. By kind of the next level of engagement comes when individuals make the decision for themselves. Now you'd figure that that would probably be the highest engaging because people just have a lot of autonomy and freedom, but it's not the highest engaging because then people are not coordinated. They're coming into the office, their teammates aren't there, they're kind of dis they're disengaged and they don't get that social interaction they would like. The lowest level of engagement comes when it's a top-down company policy or when your boss gives you the order your direct supervisor without any input from you, from the team. Those cause the least level of engagement because of course people don't have autonomy and they feel pressured. They feel like they're not adults. So you need to really trust people and understand that they'll be responsible. They'll come in when they need to come in and they'll coordinate as a team to do so. So it's a team led model of hybrid work that causes the highest engagement, the highest buy-in, the best productivity retention, outcomes and therefore lowers your costs. And generally that results in hybrid first with a minority fully remote. And that minority will generally be people who are more on individual contributor levels, or they might be teams of people who are going to be more distributed. So if you have people working in a number of offices and they can't really easily get together as a team anyway, they might choose to work fully remotely. So hybrid employees generally come in one to two days in the office, and it's going to be the majority of your team. And I've seen this, again, one to two days in the office, but it might be quite dispersed. It might be something like coming in for a week during a month or something like that, or you know, three weeks during two months, something like that. It depends on the team, and they figure out their schedule. And you need to trust them to figure out their schedule. You need to trust them that they'll be adults and figure it out. And then fully remote employees will be a minority. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. Now, as part of doing so, you really need to provide people with training on how to work effectively in a hybrid setting, for what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. Now, there are very clearly things that are best done at home and best done in the office. In fact, you have the highest productivity when you really know what to do at home and what to do in the office. So there are several things that are best done in the office that has to do with collaboration. One is more intense forms of synchronous collaboration, where you're collaborating face-to-face -face on important decisions, where you really want to figure out the nuance of other people's body language, because you can communicate most effectively, of course, when you're in person and can see everyone's expressions and body language fully. So that's synchronous communication, most intense form of communication. And that's really valuable. So kind of those team meetings that are more about making decisions, that's really helpful. Shaping each other, shaping perspectives, shaping opinions, that's helpful. Then one-on-one -on -one meetings that contain 
that are nuanced conversations. So maybe conflictual conversations or maybe making important decisions or performance evaluation conversations. Those are important and valuable to do in person where again, you can fully read each other's body language and respond to other people's emotions. So that's two. Two more things that are best done in the office is socializing and team bonding. Of course, no question for the large majority of us, not everyone, it's best done in person. And then finally, mentoring and on-the-job training. Definitely helpful to do that in person because you really want to build up that trust in person. At least start mentoring and on-the-job training in person because people really need to be vulnerable in order to ask questions that make them sound dumb. You know, the dumb questions that aren't really dumb, but people might feel that they're dumb. It's like, oh, I should know this. You know, those are things that people need to be vulnerable about, about to admit mistakes, also it's really helpful to build up trust and for people to feel vulnerable. Now, people also need to learn about effective virtual communication and collaboration. For example, just one of the things that is important is how to put communication into three buckets. Three buckets, the most intense form of communication, the, most, the one that's most collaborative, the one that you can communicate most fully is synchronous and in office because you can again read each other's body language fully engage with each other have tr more trust more relationship building then more moderate form of communication that's on the moderate form of conveying messages of reading body language and less costly than being in the office is going to be synchronous virtual communication. So in the office, of course, is the most costly form of communication because you need to coordinate everyone to come in and it's difficult and it's challenging. So it's the most costly and most effective form of communication. Then moderate cost and moderate effectiveness is synchronous virtual. And the least effective cost of communication and least costly is asynchronous virtual, is asynchronous virtual with three types. One is text, so Slack messages, Microsoft Teams, email. Then a little bit more complex is going to be audio recordings, voicemails, and so on, and video recordings. So using Loom or TechSmith or something like that to capture your voice that conveys more body language and nuance and sending that in a message. And that's just some examples. So you need to know what to use each type of communication for and how to use each of them effectively. And so that is an example of where you need to train people on effective virtual communication and collaboration. Now, I want to share with you an example of someone who adopted this team-led approach and have you check out Craig Knobloch's approach to this question. So this is Craig Knobloch, and he is the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California, which is a 100, 300 plus people institute on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So very hot topics, very valuable staff, and definitely something that oh, they found to be quite helpful to have this hybrid first, ugh, Team, to have this team-led approach to hybrid work. Let's see what Craig Knobloch has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, 
uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. And something that Craig doesn't mention is that they were actually written up in the New York Times for their effective approach to hybrid work, their leadership in hybrid work. You can look it up, just look up Information Sciences Institute, New York Times, and you'll find that they write up about their work. Now, thinking about this, the team-led model and Craig's perspective, I'm curious what you think about this team-led approach for yourself. How valuable would it be? it would be for you to integrate this approach into your workplace. Please go ahead and vote. Okay. Uh, I think... Yep, almost everyone voted, five more seconds. Vote on the team-led approach. How, what do you think about it? Great, over two thirds of you would find it highly valuable and the rest would find moderately valuable. That's excellent and you'll get some resources after the presentation to help you implement this. Great. So let's talk about another technique that would be helpful, solving specific problems with collaboration in hybrid work. How do you build teams in a hybrid work setting? It's more difficult than to do in a fully in-person setting. So one way to do so is to do virtual co-working. This replaces a typical co-working that you would have with people sitting around open office and being able to communicate with each other around anything. And this involves technique of virtual co-working involves working alongside your team members on a video conference call, much like this one. So what you would do is you would do for really fully virtual teams, this would be an everyday for hybrid teams, it would be on days that are not coming into the office. You sign into a one hour video conference call, much like was one, but except of course, we don't do any presentations. This is just going to be a one hour video conference call for you to work on your individual tasks, not to work on your collaborative tasks. It's not meant to be chatting time. It's meant to be your individual tasks. So you start by sharing the things in which you'll work. Then you turn off your microphone, you leave your speakers on so you can hear if other people want to speak up. And then your video is going to be optional, whatever you prefer. I see that extroverted people tend to leave the video on, introverted people tend to not. Then you, you do your work, but once you have questions about your work or you have comments about something the team is doing, others are doing, or you have innovation ideas or you have a problem to solve, you turn on your microphone and share that. Then your team members can discuss this, they can answer your questions, they can do screen sharing, whiteboarding, whatever is going to be helpful in your context. And finally, you turn on your microphones at the end and share what you accomplished. So generally what I see is that you'll people start working, they'll work for five minutes, 10 minutes, and somebody has a question, maybe about an email they're writing to a client and how to best phrase some wording. And then someone will chime in, give their feedback, they go back to work. Then maybe somebody in another 10, 15 minutes has an idea. Oh, I have this idea on this project that we're working on. What do you think? And then there'll be maybe a five minute conversation and I'll turn off their microphones, finish and go on. And maybe there'll be three to four conversations like this throughout this period. It's a very helpful activity for helping teams bond. Again, important facilitating innovation ideas. So this is one of the challenges with hybrid work and then integrating junior team members. It, that's very helpful because it is definitely a challenge to integrate junior team members in a hybrid work setting. Now, I'm curious about your thoughts on virtual co-working. How valuable do you think it would be for you to integrate 
this technique into your workplace. Please go ahead and vote. All right, again, most of us voted already. That's nice and quick, five more seconds. If you haven't yet shared about virtual co-working, please go ahead and share what you think. Okay, so we see this, this is the inverse of the previous one. Still, everyone found it valuable, just great. One third found it highly valuable and two thirds moderately valuable. So it's great if you find it highly valuable, again, go ahead and integrate it. If you found moderately valuable, think about what aspects of it might be valuable to integrate. Okay, let's talk about how to address another big area of challenge with hybrid work. Burnout, proximity bias, and performance evaluation. Now, proximity bias, you probably heard this term. I have a Harvard Business Review article about it. You can look it up. It has to do with worries by hybrid and remote workers that they're going to be left behind, that they're going to be forgotten by managers. And indeed, we do have research that managers tend to, and self-reportedly, report that they forget about hybrid workers and remote workers when thinking about promotion, when thinking about evaluation, when thinking about assigning projects. There's also worries and feelings of envy by people who are working in the office for those who have more flexibility. So that's another aspect of proximity bias. To address that, you really need to figure out and input a culture of excellence from anywhere into your company. That focuses on outputs, on deliverables, not inputs, not where you work, not management by walking around and seeing people working and deciding, okay, then they're working. You really want to focus on outputs, on deliverables, whatever it's KPIs, key performance indicators, OKRs, objectives and key results, however you frame it. You focus on deliverables and you evaluate each individual person on their deliverables. So that's what really helps address envy because it's not about location, it's about outcomes. If you need to be on site to get your KPIs met, then you need to be on site. If you don't need to be on site, you don't need to be on site. But it's not about being on site or not being on site, it's about the outcome and you meeting the outcome. And it helps address burnout because it focuses on what you did, not how and where you do it. So a lot of burnout comes because of performativity, where people perform productivity. There's a lot of surveys, data showing that people deliberately try to joggle their mouse or do things that would, let's say, re record Microsoft Teams data showing that they're working because they suspect that's how they're being monitored. And that's not great at all, of course. So you really don't want to monitor people this way. You want to evaluate them based on outcomes. It helps also performance management because it focuses on predetermined weekly or biweekly or monthly goals. So once a week, once every two weeks or once a month, clear goals. So you're exchanging from a big performance management only once per year, which is a typical approach to complementing that. You still have a once annual big performance management, but complementing that with weekly, biweekly or monthly performance evaluations. So how do you do this? What you want to do is have small scale performance evaluations weekly or every two weeks or every month at one-on-ones. Good managers already meet once a week or once every two weeks with their subordinates for one-on-ones and check in how their subordinates are doing and talk about things, plan things out. This just adds a performance management element to it, performance evaluation. That helps team members always know where they stand and address their psychological safety, their ability to make mistakes and pursue innovation without worrying about the consequences if they fail. And it helps build relationships with their manager, improve their relationship, which all of that helps improve retention and career growth. Now, it also helps prevent hybrid and remote workers from overworking and burning out due to anxiety, because again, if they know where they stand, they know what they need to do to either improve their performance or they can maintain their performance, which is also fine. So what that involves is that at a one-on-one, -on -one, the team member and the supervisor agree on three to five goals for the week or for the two weeks or for the month, whatever it is. By the way, for the weekly goals, that's typically tends weekly management meetings that typically tends to be people who are more junior or who need to collaborate more closely with the manager and with the team. If you do 
If you're more senior or more independent collaboration, then you'll go to maybe once every two weeks. If you're really senior or more really independent, or if you're a supervisor who's sort of lower level manager who's being evaluated by a middle manager or higher level manager, then you'll do something like once a month. So team member sends the supervisor the report on how they did on those three to five weekly goals about 48 hours before the weekly report. So report on their goal accomplishment, problem solved, and a self-evaluation. Then at the one-on-one, -on -one, the team member is evaluated on their performance by the supervisor. The supervisor coaches them on solving problems better. And then you affirm or revise the evaluation. And you set the goals for the next week. And that evaluation gets fed into a continuous promotion and evaluation report, which the supervisor would use to assign new projects, to evaluate performance. So whenever opportunities come up for roles, that's what they would use. So that is what is incredibly helpful, that coordination, collaboration between the supervisor and the team member on how to work effectively. And I want to share with you another example of someone who adopted these modalities of how to do effectively. And this is going to be Susan Winchester. She's the Chief Human Resource Officer at Applied Materials. You might have heard of Applied Materials. It's a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer, over 30-ish thousand employees, so a lot of staff. Let's see what Susan has to say. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working, where you and as many work co-workers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work, love him. Okay. Now, thinking about this, let's do a poll on this excellence from anywhere and weekly evaluations. How valuable would it be to integrate an excellence from anywhere culture with weekly performance evaluations or bi-weekly or once a month, whatever you think would be best? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Oh, this is the most popular one yet. So over three quarters of you would find it highly valuable. That's excellent. Glad to hear it. Glad to see that this was the most valuable technique. Wonderful. So this is an opportunity for you to integrate this technique into your companies and organizations. Great. So what are the takeaways from the skin collection on the future work? You want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your culture to improve your outcomes on the future of work, even though it might involve some personal discomfort for you, for leaders, whoever. Use a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote. If you want to retain your best talent, improve productivity, decrease costs, maximize well-being, and address burnout. Adapt your culture to hybrid and remote work effectively. Training on effective and hybrid work and virtual communication, collaboration, what to do at home, what to do in the office is very important. Then integrate virtual co-working. If you want to have effective collaboration, team building, and you want to integrate junior staff, and then address proximity bias, burnout, and performance management for excellence from anywhere and 
weekly performance evaluations, weekly, bi-weekly, whatever. Now, it's up to you. Go ahead and make it happen. And I hope this presentation has been helpful for you for doing so. Excellent. Now, for additional resources, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash GAE event if you're watching this as a recording. And if you're here right now, I will send them to you. No worries about it. I'll do a poll for those who want it. So copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, and free coaching session for the first three claimants. Again, I'll do a poll for those who are here and those who aren't. Go to tinyurl.com forward slash GAE event if you're doing this if you're watching this after the presentation. And I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage. Yes, Joanne, go ahead. Um, I'm working with a university. Yeah. And um, what's been your experience? So business is one world, and I'm finding the higher ed experience very different. And so I'm well, working in higher yeah. ed. Sure. I mean, Craig Nogblock is in higher ed, right? <laughs> so that's the, he's at the University of Southern California Information Sciences Institute. Yeah, I've worked with higher ed. That Those are part of my client base, definitely. I mean, being an academic myself. And it's definitely something that if the same approach works really well for higher ed. And of course, we're talking about people. So distinctly from the faculty members, we're talking about the people on the back end, on the operations, researchers. And though that's who Craig Knobloch is focusing on, of course. And that has worked incredibly well, kind of just giving them that letting teams make the decisions, pushing down the decision making to the team level, trusting them. Yeah, it works mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And then how about those people often in hourly positions that are um, are so on the ground? And, you know, you've mm -hmm. mentioned the envy and that energy in this. Yeah. Um, but there's also a hierarchy energy in that also. And so what's been your experience in engaging those people so they mm -hmm. don't feel so put upon? Well, the thing is, you want to be able to see how much flexibility you can give them. So, for example... Uh, with Craig, we had we were, had to figure out how to deal with administrators, so admin staff, right? And what we figured out is that a lot of work done by admin staff could be done remotely. Scheduling was like half of the work they did, right? <laughs> so yeah. you don't. So what they figured out was that they just needed the admin staff. They needed some people to manage the office, but they didn't need to. They previously thought that they would need the admin staff to be there full time. Because, well, they're administrators, right? That's whatever they're doing. But no, they figured out, okay, we don't need that. We just need cover for the office to do administrative staff tasks for the people who are in the office. And the people, and there again, there are many less people who are spending time in the office, so they didn't need as much support. So admin staff got to spend a bunch of time at home and do their work from home. In fact, administrative staff found that they can do much more meaningful work from home because they had lots of uninterrupted stretches of time to do their work and they can do bigger administrative tasks that took more effort and time so they were able to be more creative more engaged and they were able to retain staff who they thought that they might not be able to retain so there are definitely people who you would think that they're on the ground and you can't do anything with them who can actually have a lot of flexibility and benefits from this approach and what was the process to have the conversation to determine so it's about an awareness of what is the actual work. Yeah, an awareness yes. of what is the actual work and pushing down the decision-making to, so the when they were first thinking about this before, when I start, first started thinking with them, it was just going determination down from the top level of, okay, administrators mm -hmm. need to be there five days a week. When I started working with them, uh, I encouraged them to push down the decision-making to mm -hmm. the admin manager, not mm -hmm. make that decision at the level of Craig, no block and his executive team, but to say, okay, the administrative manager, you should make the decision. And they figured out how to make it work. How, so again, trusting the management at that level mm -hmm. to work together with a team of administrators. Uh, so there were six people, seven people who just figure work together and coordinated and figured it out and they made it work. So just pushing down that decision-making and saying, okay, 
not up to me. You figure it out. Here's the work, culture of excellence from anywhere. You make you figure out how to make sure that your work is done to excellence, and then mm-hmm. you, wherever you need to be to do that work. That that's just what, how, where it is. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Joanne. Anyone else? Five more seconds. Unmute yourself or type in the chat. Okay, I think folks are comfortable. Well, thank you, Dr. Gleb, for your time today. Uh, and thanks to all the MVHRA members and non-members that joined us for this uh, bonus event in October. Uh, we appreciate you coming and sir, it was a pleasure to, to see you today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. Have a great Bye-bye. day everybody. Bye-bye.